Ladies, sorry. Um, our next talk is um, Knut Irvin's talk on custom Debian distributions. Thank you. Uh, I just have one, one warning first. Is it possible to get this sound a bit lower? Because I'm always speaking too high. <laughs> the sound people, thank you. Uh, if you find strange spelling errors, it's just my handicap. I'm uh, totally dyslectic. So we'll have to leave it at. I just tell this to the teacher because they know how to make red marks on my uh, things that I write. Okay. I will talk about client technology a lot. And time spent maintaining um, a custom Debian distribution installation in huge municipalities. I also want to talk about economy and user experience and what next. What do we believe in uh, School of Linux Debian EDU will be important path further. And some of this, I have also this warning as a standard thing, is too complicated for teachers. So it's, if it's two teacher here or, or three, you will probably have some questions afterward. Okay, what's School of Linux Debian EDU? You have probably heard about it, but I will mention it. It's a network architecture out of the box, operational concept, digital user profile, open office, and 75 other user programs. It's tailor-made, and it's also one important thing that is, it's made for our mother tongue. In Norway, people, pupils, in regular, don't speak English. Uh, and for the most of the world, that's the case. It's about uh, 344 different countries, and it's almost over. It's almost 400 languages that are official out there. So, most of the computer programs in in education has to be in your native tongue. And it's also made for a school budget. And we have two to one to two hours to install and configure. Try that with Red Hat. Try that with Windows Server. Good luck. Uh, we have also had some user evaluations uh, from different parties. And uh, we don't, in this presentation, do any, what you call it, kind of saying that Linux or free software or whatever is good enough. Everybody has said that it's good enough in our perspective, in our ex experience. So I will go to the economical realities. This is the situation in the Norwegian schools. The headmaster has to choose between hardware and people. The cost of operating uh, infrastructure with ICT as an add-on to the other teaching activities cost one to two positions. The municipality in Nittedal, in 2002, 2001, they said, we're going to standardize on Windows 298 because that is the only thing we have the money to, to run, and the hardware. After they introduced School Linux in 2002, they haven't the money to choose Windows <laughs> uh, because of the prices of the hardware. There you have it. And I believe this is the same situation in Sweden, in Denmark, in Finland, and if you can think that this is countries that is almost the richest country in the world, you can just imagine how it is in Spain, in Africa, in India, in China, in Italy. Thank you. So to believe, as uh, somebody mentioned in my, my room, that, it, well, it's just buy a new, new computer. It's not. The money isn't there. So to believe to buy a new computer is out of the questions for most of the schools. Now we're going to talk about client technology, and I will go f fast because I have some uh, summing up in the end. The traditional computer architecture in the 90s was or are thick clients. And they run everything on the client. But the most important thing is that you have considerable administration 
of software on each client. The program is run locally and are administrated on every client. And this gives uh, good support of application. You have one structure of saving files. You can do it on a server. And services can be centralized. You have used moderate band bandwidth, but you must have newer hardware. And the single structure of running application is around 150 euros annually to operate every PC. And that's market prices in Norway, not included cost for hardware, network, licenses, or ICT person at the school that doing the pedagogical work or helping out shifting out uh, old uh, hardware that don't work anymore. So the schools don't have the money, so they suggest to, oh, yeah, we have no money, we will use Windows 98 and we will put on the top a graphical terminal, Citrix or FreeNX. That will breathe uh, new life into our computer, yes, but it's expensive and uh, now I'm gonna explain why. This is the basic concepts. What about FreeNX and Citrix? You mo must have a local thick client to run a graphical terminal on top. The user application is run centrally, both local and central operation. You probably should reuse FreeNX. It uses half the bandwidth of uh, Citrix, but uh, if you have limited bandwidth anyway and places your server centrally, you have uh, saturation and other complication that really kills off the client. You don't have the support of sound really good. You, it's, it's not just working as the pupils expect it to work with media rich application with animation, with s small movie clips and such that is very popular in the first and secondary, uh, the first years you are starting at a school. And because you have to have two, uh, you have to also support media-rich application. You also need a lot of workstation. Then you get double structures of running a user application, and the twice r the price, the cheapest price we have in a huge installation, running Citrix is 240 euro per machine. Then it's market prices, it's huge installation, not included cost for hardware network licenses or ICT contacts at every school. So what did we do, do then five years ago? We said that real thin clients who may make new life without a hard drive, no moving parts on the clients, it will really solve the problem using the hardware. The, all the applications and all the installed software is run from one server. The thin clients just handle keyboard, graphics, no local administration. And we also newly have deployed a lot of installation with this workstation. Then we can support, really give support to everything. Video, USB, DVD, more complicated Java application, Flash, games, etc. And you get as little administration as with the thin clients. Okay. So here you are. The programs are run locally, but is administrated centrally. And this gives a simple structure for running user application. And the price running this is 150 euro annually, annually operating the system. And the reason is mostly because of the software where you run it. We have done some calculation from the, with the municipality of Oslo, the main city in Norway, with three schools as an example, 400 users, 150 clients at every school. And we have one advantage that mac maximum 60% of the machines is concur in concurrent use. And. Uh, here you are then on to servers. This, this, will, this will be a good one for uh, Fuji Siemens or, or HP or Dell. They will sell a lot of servers. So if you go, go for Citrix, 
you, you are there, you have a lot of service. But the School Linux effort is about saving money for the school, so we r really recommend thick clients or half thick clients, even with Windows. And the most important cost factors are concurrent users, the amount of servers, the maintenance of client software, and here are the market prices. Have you seen a picture like this before? Who? Okay, it's the Italian <laughs> humor. Uh, the thing is that when you, <laughs> you put uh, this on a graph and you look at 30 clients, 60 clients, and 120 clients in a marketplace and you ask for the prices as we have done. You can see that if you ask for a, if you have an operation, a school with 30, cli 30 clients, you ask the market price to run this, or you have 60 or 120. And compare the prices running the server is about on Linux 24,000 Norwegian crowns. I don't remember what's in Euro, but it's around that. You add also on what it costs to operate every client because it's concurrent users that is the price factor on operating the system. Then you get to have some interesting results. Graphical terminals are three times more expensive than running workstation with Windows and Linux, if you have 120 clients. Uh, graphical terminals don't scale any as well as they do with workstation. The same thing you have about thin clients is that it don't scale so well as workstation, but it's cheaper in the first place because of the software running on the server. But if you look to less disks workstation, then you really have scalability. And the re reason for that is that you're running software from one place. You can almost run 150 clients with uh, work, uh, diskless or li less disks workstation. Yes? The difference between thin clients is that, that when running the application on a thin client, every application runs on a server. Running the applications on a diskless or less disk workstation, every application runs, every user application runs on the client hardware. So it's more like a workstation, but the hard drive is placed on the server, okay? And uh, this, uh, this is old technology too. It's like uh, Windows 3.0 with Novell, but uh, it was not possible to do that with Windows 95 because of registry, okay? So uh, it's not a new thing. It's uh, about 18 years old way of thinking. I believe that they did it on Unix too, 20 years ago. And what does this tell us? It tells us that this less workstation or half thick clients are the most cost efficient solution if you have a server infrastructure. With running cost that is 40% less than all, all other alternatives. Using Citrix, Windows Terminal Server or FreeNX cost more than three times more compared to any other client alternative. Laptops are probably the same price ratio uh, as thin client. Windows Workstation has almost the same maintenance cost as Linux workstation if the hardware is identical. No schools have identical hardware after one year. <laughs> because, and then you have to have different images to soft up the clients, okay? So we know this is kind of dif disappointing, that one, because Linux could be as expensive to run and to maintain as Windows thick clients. So if you choose the Extremadura architecture, you get higher maintenance costs, okay? Because they have a lot of workstations installed. The price difference between Linux on, on this alternative is that you don't need to buy software, okay? And if you're running Linux workstation, the software in the schools for the price of cheap hardware. 
oh, after five, six years, the licenses to Microsoft with school prices is the same as hardware. So you can say that if you go for workstation, you will after five years have paid all your hardware if you are running uh, uh, Linux. You, and compared to, to Windows, you will get twice as much hardware for your money. There you have it. And it's also one more thing in this uh, story. From a political standpoint, if, you, if they're going to promote Citrix, the suppliers have heavy interest in solution they recommend to the school because they earn more money. Uh, the other thing is that functionality of the user applications heavily depend on where to place the running of the application. It should be run near the user. But we have in Norway this discussion of a lot of ICT services in the municipalities that really want to run Citrix because they believe it saves money. It's not saving money in the school, but they believe it does. And when they do that, they remove the application from the user kind of way, and they have to transport uh, uh, graphics and everything on a Citrix or FreeNX, and then there you have it. You don't really are able to support media-rich application because of the bandwidth limitation, even if Norway has this grand plan of do giving everybody, uh, every school, uh, one gigabit uh, bandwidth. And the most important factor is to educate the teachers because they don't know how to use the equipment. Now I will go and show you some results from the municipality and the workload in medium-sized Norwegian municipalities and large ones. And if you look to the left, you will see that Hurum has 200 clients, Kongsvinger 450. They have increased that to almost 600 today. Nittedal have uh, 506 clients and the city of Oslo have 10 they had planned to, in 2008, to have 25,000 or almost 26,000 clients. The interesting thing is that they use one half a position, just 50% of a week, to operate these installations. And they also have a central pedagogic resource. And at the school, they have or have not an ICT contact. That helps out if some technical thing breaks. In Hurum, uh, the municipality, the centralized operator does every maintenance of, of the hardware himself. If they call him, he will change the machine. On Kongsving, in Kongsvinger, they use three, almost three and a half hours a week with few, five thin clients at every school. In Nittedal, they use one to two hours a week with 50 thin clients. In Oslo, they have 12 work hours a week, 150 thin clients. This is the workload. And I have to ask you one control question here. Uh, how much is it, what is the, um, if you have 100 clients on your workplace, how many pe persons are employed running that operation? What's the usual amount of uh, work hours? You probably know this. You know somebody that runs 100 clients, 200 clients? Nobody knows. Give it like a shot. Yeah. I think it's one man for 50 to 100 clients. One man for, say it once more because he has the microphone and everybody will listen to it. Generally, we say one man for 50 to 100 clients. Okay, one man. 50 to 100 clients, okay. Here you have it, you have one man, and it's all have also a pedagogic responsibility for 450 clients, okay, or half a position. Locally, if you add that to 10 schools, you also have a, a week. So you have almost one and a half work week, I call it that in Norwegian, I'm sorry. But anyway, you have one and a half position running f 450 clients. Okay. There we have it. At the schools, they use one third, one fifth of what's 
the regular manpower running an operation, okay? Uh, <coughs> we have put that up in our charter when running LTSP clients on older PCs. ICT context, central operation, what it costs annually. And it differ a little. It all is very efficient. I'm learn I have learned them as myself. <laughs> this is my uh, guys. Hurium has a lot of money. So they have built uh, one gigahertz infrastructure. They have more money for every client. They have bought newer equipment. Kongsvinger is bit between. Half of their schools have one gigabyte uh, fiber to their uh, schools. And uh, four of them have just 1.5 megabyte to their school. But anyway, that's not so important. The important thing is the annual cost of every client. Here you have it. And if you add on the hardware, you will see that just 60 to 70 percent, or as much as 70 percent of the cost is manpower. And we also have calculated the cost in 2008, doubling the amount of PCs, because every municipality really does that. They double the amount of, of PCs, because it's uh, mandatory now to have computers in the education. And the interesting thing is that there are, in fact, a reduced cost here for centralized operations. So the person running the installation centrally, they want to double the amount of, uh, of the clients, but they don't increase the manpower because they don't believe it necessary to do that. So School of Linux is pretty scalable. And we have also one more uh, observation. It's more cheap or it's cheaper to do, do centralized operation than a local one. So if you have an ICT operated operator on every school's running the operation and not have anything centrally and don't centralize, it's more expensive. And it's more expensive running Windows than Think Clients. And the, the uh, parties that say this is Teleplan. It's a kind of private but uh, independent uh, uh, firm that just does in, invest, in, investigates what thing cost in a telecom market. And the municipality of Oslo, they used 2.5 Norwegian million, million crowns to invest, investigate this. And what does experiences in municipality, municipality tell, tells us? Central operation is the most efficient way to maintain the system. The school Linux scales well. Thin clients are cheaper to maintain than thick clients in most of the cases. The co uh, cost of Microsoft licenses over five to six years is the same as the hardware. It also tells us that uh, suppliers have to cut the amount of client or reduce the cost of operation to match school Linux. Why pay more to get less? And this is a market thing. Uh, this last one is a marketing uh, question. Because uh, school Linux is uh, propagating and operating in a marketplace. It's not a kind of national effort. It's a kind of we have to compete in the marketplace. And this one is probably the most important thing for the decision makers. If you have to choose for one infrastructure with Linux compared to Windows or proprietary solution, you have this advice to the decision makers to make a budget showing them what Linux costs and showing them what Windows costs. Okay. I will just go through some objections we meet in the usability space or user space. Yeah, you can ask more question. Um, I was wondering if uh, maybe on those cost analysis, um, you saw that there was a uh, strong impact on the term in terms of cost uh, because of the um, uh, um, the technical training for the operators switching from Windows ser terminals to to Windows-based terminals. I mean, if it was 
I know. Uh, if you had more costs because of that. Yeah. Uh, the thing he asked about is the cost of training for for Linux operators. Is that correct? Okay. I will take that because it's I'm coming to that now. And I will take the objection that we meet all day. School Linux don't support some. Open Office makes a mess. Using School Linux don't prepare their pupils on their future jobs. You have to be a Linux guru to operate the system. Here you are your question. And there are no pedagogic programs on Linux. This is our, uh, this is our work every day with Debian EDU, okay? Objections about the clients. Some does not work on School Linux. Some works on thin clients, but you have to turn it on. And it's not always there, so you have to ask your vendor or your supplier of reused thin clients to turn it on and have sometimes to find the right uh, sound card. And it's not easy, but it's doable. With this text and thick clients, it just works. Remember, clients are intended to use in uh, on 10 years old hardware. That's machine that you will just throw away anyway. So to expect that to give sound, I believe you should place it in the areas in the school, in the library, where it's expected to be sound free. You shouldn't have sound at all. And just choose half thick clients in the music lab, the places where you need sound. So there you are, have it considered this less workstation that will give you the sound. The other objection is about OpenOffice.org. OpenOffice make a mess when people take document home from school, okay? The people has MS Office, the parent have MS Office at their home. What to do with OpenOffice? The most easy thing is to turn on the support of Microsoft Office 97 as a default. Teacher or teach the people to save MS Office 97 for the home use. It's easier to do that in the uh, secondary school. Or give them a CD with open office to use at home. Tell the parent what to expect. Strangely enough, in school, Norway we really promote, we, we really have done a lot of political work to, in, uh, to make the government support open standards. And we have this one question. If I'm going to have a dialogue with the public offices or to interchange some data, whatever, should I be a customer of Microsoft? We have asked this question a lot of times. And they say, the government say, we should not be a customer of Microsoft. You should choose every operating system you want to. But anyway. <laughs> Coming to the daily work, the teacher are not there. So how should we manage that? And the easiest way is to turn on open office support. Uh, it should say 97 here. As a default doc documentation, if you're going to have an easy life. Uh, and this is a huge objection. Much learn Microsoft because of work possibilities. And the answer is, my kid should not learn niche products. Well, the main objection is my kid shouldn't learn niche products. But then we have this argument, and this is a bit difficult. Uh, the first one, we did not know f 15 years ago that WordPerfect should be replaced by Microsoft. We don't know what to expect in 10 years. So the people should be able to handle change. And that's why it's a good thing to learn people's different solution. OK. The other one thing does not exclude the other. Is the other, uh, what do you call it, helping to get rid of the objections. And most of the teaching programs is platform independent. You get it on the web. And here we are, your question, the Linux guru question. We don't trust Linux people that are interested in the course. If you are a person that are into Debian, you are a danger for your community or for your municipality. Have you, have you heard that one before? Yeah. Dangerous. Yeah, dangerous. Look at them. <laughs> Strange shirts and, you know. 
Uh, but many municipalities that have started with schoolings have no prior knowledge. They run big installation today without being a Linux guru, and they also support Windows on some clients. They really uh, they rely little on external support that is easy to find in 2006. That was not the situation five years ago. Much has changed. And experiences with the municipality you have seen here is that you need, they say that to me, two things. You, don't, you need less support. The person that had started rolling out School of Linux have no prior experiences. And they have done it anyway. And they have done a bigger installation that they were ever able to do with competitive proprietary software, okay? And they have just learned the thing through the net and some small courses. So every money spent on doing this is the opposite that we tell them. We tell them that you need more money to learn Linux. The truth are that the municipality that has started with School of Linux and rolled it out and supporting it uses less time learning it, less time supporting it, less time to buy external consultants. So who is telling that Linux is more expensive? The person that sells support that are more expensive than Linux. But this is very difficult to explain because people don't believe that the, what do you call it, the second runner-up is cheaper than the biggest and most supported platform. Uh, here the last one. There are no pedagogic programs on Linux. We use Drill Pro is a popular program in Norway, and other programs running on Windows that don't run on Linux. Well, we run the, those program with Vine, and it works. Most of the pedagogical prog programs is used in the web browser, so uh, the most of the vendors now test it out on Firefox on Linux, and the most of the school with school Linux has completed the national exams with success using the national exams in the web browser. And I will sum this up. I have two more minutes. Five, okay. We have some difficulties, and this I will propose, and this will be a kind of, we want to work together with uh, in Debian EDU just to fix some things that are problematic for us. The first is that in School Linux 2.0, the swap and the thin client was turned off as default. All of the clients with through the two megabyte RAM crashes in some municipality, we talks about 50% of the machines. It's about 250 to 500 clients that don't work anymore. And that's not good for your reputation, is it? Upgrades from one version one of School Linux to 2.0 is too difficult. Multi-level configuration will handle a lot of that. Do you know what multi-level configuration are? Is that known to you? Multi-level configuration? Yeah. Okay. It's a bit, uh, some by times it's up, yeah, five minutes. And <laughs> I ask because we really need help on that. Because when, when upgrading the configuration breaks, we have also done some hacking in school links that have made it more difficult to upgrade, but we really have some, we need, need some solution that makes upgrades easier. And the hardware support is not good enough on laptops, even on servers. So we have tailored Kubuntu with laptops with the configuration files we need that connects the laptops to the school's network. And we also, in the future, probably will be nice to have support for multi-architecture that can support different clients because we could have AMD 64 processor on the server and we have half thick clients with Intel i386 support or Intel i686. And my last advice on this talk is don't talk negative about different desktop solutions. It's application that the user wants, talking negative about other reflects back on yourself. That said, people that has used Windows tend to like KDE. That's a, just an observation. It's a not a science study, 
but it's the feedback from the teachers. You can't, if you are come from a Windows world, it's a bit easier. Our competitor is proprietary software. The ICT service in the municipality or the headmasters could be bought. They love Windows, okay? It's safe. We go after the lowest hanging fruit. We help people that want help. Why, do, why use our scare resor scared, scarce resources on people that won't have any help? And here you have some more guys in Norway. Joey is up there someplace, uh, Andreas. Uh, you probably have some questions. Thank you. If no one has, I have one. There's not much time left, but if you can tell what, what I mean, we've seen the Scholar Linux is successful. We have seen that Scholar Linux is successful. It would be interesting since we are all around here with lots of Debian developers to know what Debian can do with Scholar Linux, where it works well, where uh, problems are still around, and uh, if you can give suggestion to make the life of Scholar Linux easier. The three suggestions we have is that, uh, to turn on the swap on the LTSB. That's the shortest win. The second one is the multi-level architecture. It's, and we have a, a third one. Uh, well, not multi-level architecture, but the multi-level configuration. And then the multi-level architecture in the future. But the other things is more handleable. handleable. Yeah. My Norwegian English, thank you. So, um, so and hardware support with unit you know, we have always some objection when the bosses in the municipality don't the Debian don't work on their laptops. They tend to go to Red Hat. They tend to go to Kubuntu. That's a back, uh, that's a step backwards because they should use their Debian that they use on their servers. It was one more question. Over there, I suppose. I, uh, okay. Yeah. If, if you can shortly say what kind of applications or the list of applications that you include. Well, the, I can say something. We include a lot of the application, but the most used one is the web browser. Okay. The teacher don't really know yet what to use in their lap on the work. They don't know about computers. So the biggest problem we have now in Norway is to get the use of the systems. They have installed it, but uh, it's, a, it's a kind of thing that uh, the use of the computer have a bit stagnated in the seventh and ninth class level or school level. So it's the web browser, then it's the office application. The pupils hate the office application. It's so boring, they shouldn't use it. But anyway, they, have to use, they are enforced to using it. But uh, it's a lot of other applications that uh, are not very in use, but it should be used. It's squeak land with, with e-toys and making simulation, that kind of things. K-stars, uh, that kinds of science application. That's popular in the science department, but it's not widely used. So we are measuring that to catch up what's really in use and try to promote lections and sharing lection using the right software. Thank you. I have to wrap up, probably. Okay? Yeah. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, all help we can get from the Debian community will be nice to get to school links, and we will promote it as hell in the whole of Europe, in Africa, in India, whatever. So help us, please. Thank you. <laughs>